Hello, welcome back. So what we're going to do in this video is actually download and examine the NetCDF file that we get from the data request we made in the previous video. So if your request completed satisfactory, you should find that when you go, if you remember, if we go to the Your Requests tab, on the Copernicus website I introduced in the last video, we now find we have a list of requests that are uh, with the status of completed. So we have a green download button here on the right hand side. We also have the size of the file and you can see that one month's worth of data which is global for a single field on a single level. Uh, we retrieve the two meter temperature has a file size of 1.5 gigabytes because we have all the days of one month and we have all of the times in one day, 24 hourly steps. So the files are quite large. So now we can just proceed to click the download button and then you should get a save dialog box here. Now you will notice that the save file name has a very strange file name suggested with an internal request number and so on uh, which is rather obscure so you probably want to alter that to a, a, a more logical name such as T2M and then the the year of the data. Then you basically click a location. I've actually clicked on new folder previously and made a new folder here class and then clicked on save. Now you'll find it depends on your internet speed, it will take quite a while to download that data. So once you've done that, you set it off and it will start to download. So I'm going to move this window to one side and minimize this. So what you need to do now is open a terminal window. And if you're using a Mac, I'm using a Mac here, so I've got a terminal window which runs the uh, uh, the ZSH shell, which is a, uh, sh should we say, uh, an enhancement of the, uh, the classical bash shell. If you're using an Ubuntu machine, you can also open a terminal window and run basically these same commands. If you're using Windows 10, as you'll see in the comments below the video, then what you can do is actually install Ubuntu as a subsystem now under Windows 10. It's very easy to do. And once you do that, you can simply click on the terminal symbol and open a terminal and you basically have uh, um, Ubuntu directly under Windows 10. So this makes this very easy. So all of these three common platforms, you can use these same commands. So first of all, we have to make sure that we're in the directory where the file is found. So the first Linux command we need is pwd, print working directory. And you can see I'm in users Tompkins class, which is the directory, the folder where I saved the data file earlier. So we can list the files using ls. Now we can see that we've got one previously downloaded netcdf file, which I've just called t2m.nc. And then this is the download which I just started from a website which is currently underway. So what we want to do now, first of all, is we want to um, basically examine the netcdf file and we're going to use two utilities to do this. So the first utility is called ncdump. Now ncdump, if we then we need the file name. A little tip here, by the way, is if you start to type a file name, if it's unique, you can press the tab button and it basically auto-completes up until the point that the file name is unambiguous. So if you have two files that start with the initial first few letters the same, it will only complete up to the point where the string is unique and then it will stop. And if you press tab again, it will give you a list of the choices. Here we only have one file that's starting with this name. So when I press tab, we get auto-completion of the whole file name.
what we're going to do now is if we do NC dump T to M, what happens? Well, it basically dumps everything in the file. Uh, there's a lot of numbers. As we said in the previous video, these are very, very large files. So I'm going to interrupt this with Control C. Okay, and so what we're going to do now is we are going to run the command again. So I can press the up arrow to get to the previous command. And instead of just simply saying dump the whole file, I'm going to add an option. So we have NC dump and a space, and then we're going to use minus H. Now using the minus H, the H stands for header. And so this option says, only dump the header of the file. So let's see what happens now. So we press enter, and again it's scrolled up, but we can scroll back down, back to where we first typed in the command. You can see the command here. So what does it show us? It shows us, first of all, it says netcdf, so the format of the file, t2m, the file name, and then we have a curly brackets. And now we see those different sections that were described in the previous video. So let's go through these in turn. The first is the dimensions, if you recall. So these describe the dimensions of which the variables can be a function. So we have a dimension called longitude, and it says equals 1440. That basically tells us how many longitude cells we have. So we have 1,440 longitude cells. Latitude, 721 cells. Okay, so that's half of the amount of longitude points as we would expect if the resolution of the data is the same in the longitude and the latitude dimension. We then have 744 times. If you do a quick back of the envelope calculation, you can see this is what we expect. It's the number of days in a month multiplied by 24 slices. So now we come to the next section, which is the variables section. We have the actual values and the metadata for the dimensions. Now the first thing it says is float. So this tells us what type that variable is. So float, of course, is a real number but you can see that the time is actually stored as an integer. So we have the longitude, and now we have basically the other metadata. So the longitude has units of degrees underscore east, and the longitude long name is longitude as well, so it's the same as the short name. Now just to point out, if you recall, right at the end of the last video, I said that there are climate and forecasting conventions that have been de defined that are usually abbreviated to CF conventions. And so this unit's value of the field, degrees underscore east, is actually the standard CF conventions for longitude. So we could have just put east or D east or deg east. All of those would be valid and a user reading those attributes would understand what it meant. However, because it's not this standard that's defined by the CF conventions, many programs that open the file wouldn't recognize this as longitude, even though it has the longitude name. So it's important if you're creating a file to try and look up what the CF conventions are and try and stick to the standards in the definition of your file. So latitude, we have degrees underscore north, and then for the time, again, this is again using CF conventions. So we have the units, hours, since, and then we have a date and time in a standard date time format. So you can use hours since or days since. The long name is time. And then we have the calendar type, which is Gregorian. Next, we come to the variables. Now this file only has one variable inside it. Now it's a short, and we'll come back to what that means in a moment. And it's t2m, which is a function of time, of latitude, and of longitude. We have, first of all, these two metadata, which are called scale factor and add offset. I'm going to come back to those in just a moment. But let's just skip by those just for a second. We have t2m, we have the fill value. If you remember from the last video, 
This refers to a value where if you find this value, minus 32,767, and S stands for, again, a short type, it means that that value is missing. This is the T to M units, so they are Kelvin, K, and then the long name is two meter temperature. So if you recall, T2M maybe doesn't say very much to a user who's not familiar with this kind of data, but immediately in the long name, we can see what the variable is. Last but not least, we have the global attributes. So we have conventions, and the, which is CF 1.6. So these are the conventions used to define these attributes. And then we have history. So this is a common global attribute, and it tells us how the file has been created. So we can see that because we requested the data in an XCDF format, that after it's been retrieved, now actually on their internal systems, this data is stored in a GRIB format, which is another self-describing file type. And so it's being converted from GRIB into an XCDF file using this command internally. And that command is actually being added then to the history so you can see exactly what has gone on and how this file has been created. I just quickly want to go back and talk about this add offset and scale factor. What you'll see is that this T2M is actually listed as being a short. So what does that mean? Well, let's go back to the previous command where we try to dump the whole file. So that dumps not just the header, but the actual contents of the dimensions and the variables too. So these numbers, I'm going to interrupt this, these numbers are actually temperature values, but they don't seem very realistic as temperature values. 3,681 Kelvin would be pretty toasty. This is because the data is, has been stored in a compact way. To actually get the real value of the temperature, what we need to do is take that integer and we need to apply a scale factor and add an offset. In other words, the actual value is the scale factor times the value in the file, and then you have to add the offset 2.261.7724. So in this way, the data is compacted. Now, if you don't like that and you want to actually store it as a float, I will show in the next video how to convert into a full float, which of course will inflate the file sizes, but means that when you do NC dump, you see the values directly. So we've seen in today's film how we can use NC dump to interrogate a file and see what the contents are by reading the header. In the next video, what we're going to do is use another utility, NC view, in order to graphically display that file and the variables within. We can use that utility to see the values at certain locations and also generate time series or even animate the different frames of the file. So hopefully I'll see you soon in the next video. Thank you very much.